In this video, I'm going to explain to you how MS neurologists like myself diagnose primary progressive multiple sclerosis. Tune in, because that starts right now. Howdy! Learn about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this channel to help my own patients learn between clinic visits, and it's my hope that I can help you learn too. I use easy to understand language to bring you approachable and accurate multiple sclerosis education. So if you're impacted by MS and you want to up your game, make sure to sign up for the channel right now. And please click that notifications bell so you don't miss any of our upcoming content. I was recently asked the question, how does one diagnose primary progressive multiple sclerosis? In this video, I'm going to walk you through exactly how we apply the diagnostic criteria. Primary progressive MS is less common, seen in about 10 to 15 percent of the total MS population. It presents about a decade later than relapsing or remitting MS. So a typical onset of PPMS is around age 40. Unfortunately, primary progressive MS tends to progress faster in disability compared to relapsing or remitting MS. And it's called primary progressive MS because people experience a slow and typically steady worsening of neurological disability completely independent of attacks. Unlike relapsing MS, which tends to occur much more in women as compared to men, in primary progressive MS, the sex ratio is literally one to one. Now with that preamble, I like to introduce the 2017 revised McDonald criteria. These are the most recent and updated criteria accepted by the MS neurological community used to diagnose primary progressive MS. The first of the two elements deals with the clinical course. This is determined by talking to the patient in understanding their clinical history by listening. And what we're looking for is a slow, steady decline in function at over at least a year's time. This is typically insidious and it occurs in the absence of a clinical attack. So there's no history of a relapse and there's no history of a remission. Instead, there's at least a one year period, although it could be much longer, of a slow, steady decline in neurological function. Once you've established that the clinical history is suggestive of a slow, steady neurological decline, suggestive of progression, and in the absence of attack, you look for supporting evidence. And so the second element of the criteria is to have two of the three following things. Thing number one, an MRI of the brain with a T2 bright lesion seen in one of the classic MS locations. Those could be periventricular, juxtacortical, cortical, or in the brainstem, the infratentorium. And you need one brain lesion in any of those locations. The second thing is to have a spinal cord with at least two T2 bright lesions. And the third thing is to have spinal fluid that demonstrates unpaired oligoclonal bands. Now to clarify, you don't need all three of those things, you just need two of the three. You also have to make sure that you're not missing a diagnosis that can mimic multiple sclerosis, of which there are many. In summary, to diagnose primary progressive MS, it requires at least a year of a slow insidious progression and disability, completely independent from attacks coupled with two of three following things. Brain MRI with at least one lesion in a classic location, cervical or thoracic spine MRI with at least two lesions, and spinal fluid that is positive for unpaired oligoclonal bands. And so there you have it, a quick didactic on how we diagnose primary progressive multiple sclerosis using the 2017 revised McDonald criteria. I hope that you found this video helpful. And if so, please feel free to give it a like. Just so you guys know, I love reading your comments and questions. Please feel free to leave any comments and questions you have below. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. Until the next video, take care.